So first of all, before I start whacking away about EDRs in C Sharp, I wanted to say how good it actually is to see everyone in person again. It's amazing. So thank you all for actually coming here and staying until the very end. I realize it's the last talk, so I appreciate you all being here and to the organization. Well done. I didn't see any problems, so that's amazing. So originally, as you can see on the slide, I was going to present about defeating EDRs in C Sharp, but I actually social engineered Brucom. Why? Because that was indeed originally the plan, and I'm still going to do it, but it's not just going to be me talking about defeating EDRs in C Sharp. The CFP for Brucon was actually quite far from the conference itself, and after the CFP closed, and I got the news that I got accepted, I saw a random tweet in my Twitter feed from a guy named Class Virus, or at least that's his handle, and he tweeted, blog posts plus tool release. And I saw EDR bypass framework, I saw DLL manual mapping, direct syscall invocation, I was intrigued. So I started reading his blog post, and suddenly I see my own name. I don't know if you see it. It's not Jean-Francois, it's just Jean, Jean Mas, because that's my Twitter handle. I saw myself referenced, and I thought, wow, that's actually quite cool. And I don't know if some of you know this, but I actually did the defeating EDRs in C-sharp already at uh, Black Hat. So I guess that's where Alessandro probably saw the talk. But I'm going to let him um, do the whole story. So Alessandro, you can go ahead. Yeah, hi there. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. And yes, I was contemporaneously doing a research on AB, next gen AB, and EDR bypass in Userland, uh, both in C Sharp, uh, Native Code, and PowerShell. And yes, I saw the presentation from GemMess, and I found it like very good and very well explained. So I decided to just take part of it and design a new blog post and a new like white paper on my own tool, which is a framework called Inceptor, which can be used to like automatically uh, implement in an implant uh, like well-known techniques to bypass EDR and next-gen AB. And so I just tweeted this, and I, I mean, I always give credit where credit is due, so thanks, Jan, thanks, John. <laughs> You're John, welcome. And, yeah, <laughs> and we're here. So that's the story. Uh, right, awesome. So the CFP was already entered. I couldn't change the name anymore. And maybe that's a good thing because I actually came up with probably the longest talk name in the history of talks. So it's now a trip down history lane on how to defeat EDRs in user mode, how to do it using the invoke, and how these conference talks inspire others with a little bit of inception, which is a nudge to the Inceptor framework. So what are we actually going to talk about today? Well, I decided to do something a little bit different, and I actually created a doodle for it. So Has I don't know this I... ever happened you to go. you? You have been hired to do a penetration test and need to get a reverse shell or other payload on your target, but the antivirus or EDR is in the way. Today is your lucky day. In the next 45 to 60 minutes, John and Alessandro will walk you through the history of cybersecurity and tell you how modern adversaries evade alerts in user land. So sit back and enjoy the presentation. So yeah, there you go. Has this actually funny story? I actually hired a uh, a native American speaker for that because I wasn't really too sure about my accent or Alessandro's accent. So I kind of wonder what that guy must have felt like when he received the script. Uh, but yeah, he did it anyway. He uh, he got he got some uh, he got a payday, so it's nice. So who are we? Well, I'm Jean-François Mas. I work at TrustedSec, and I'm also a SANT instructor. I teach the SEC Security 699, which is a Purple Team course. So if you're interested in both offense and defense, and you want to combine the two, well, be sure to check the course out if you want to. Uh, as I said, I am a SANT instructor, but I also work at TrustedSec, which is an American company. It was already referenced yesterday as well. We are yeah, a cybersecurity firm in America, and I'm also a toolsmith. I regularly drop tools on GitHub. If you know me on Twitter, I say that I publish barely functioning tools, which is actually accurate. Um, but yeah, there you go. I kind of do, do it because I want to give back to the community, but also because I want to learn. Some of the things I release are things that 
obviously already have been implemented in better shapes or forms, but I just do it to learn coding on myself. Uh, so yeah, that's me. And this guy, is here. this guy here is not me, no, it's me. And um, I'm Alessandro Magnosi. I work for BSI now. I'm a senior security consultant there. Um, and except for that, I'm working for CNAC, Red Team. So I'm a bug, bug hunter, mostly. Um, and of course, I also, did, I also do a lot of public work. And when I say public work, I mean I release a lot of tools that, I mean, I build tools to help my work and my daily job and also help me with bug bounties. So I always want to just share because I think that only sharing there is improvement. And this is the reason why I also published Inceptor. I want the community, the community to help me to make these things better and to be like, to help the, the work of my work and the, and the work of everyone. Um, so that's it. That is my Twitter handle and GitHub. You can go there. You can, I'm reachable. I'm like very open. So if you want to help, Please help. Actually, this is most of, I'm begging for help, I guess. Uh, <laughs> yeah, mostly, yeah, because uh, of course, yeah, it would be, it, it's cool if we can, I mean, I think that together we can achieve more, so. Yeah, I absolutely believe that is true as well. And I've got to admit, I haven't seen all the talks, so I don't know if anyone actually did this, but I'm always interested when I attend conferences, but usually I'm not the one on stage, so now I have the power to actually do this. Um, by the raise of hands, who's actually more of like red oriented than a pen tester? All right, cool. So it's actually pretty mixed, which is surprising because I always thought it was more of a like a red oriented crowd. So it's always nice to see some some blue people as well in the crowd. That's fantastic. The agenda for today is uh, well ten bullet points. Uh, I'm not going to walk over them. You can read for yourself. Um, I'm going to make a joke, and I don't know if it's, well, it's getting live streamed, so I, I don't want to uh, be rude or anything, but in the EDRs or malware section, I always like to joke that EDRs are hookers, and don't mean like ladies, just, yeah, you're, you're going to see in just a moment. So if I offend anyone for that, I'm sorry, it's not intended to be offensive. Without further ado, let's take a trip down memory lane, and this is actually before I was actually a pen tester, but I obviously heard the stories. And it used to be back in the days when, when Metasploit was rather new. It was rather easy for a pen tester, I'd say, or at least easier in my opinion. You could just generate your meter repeater payload, drop it on disk, execute it, and you'd get a reverse shell. Usually the antivirus wouldn't really complain. Shikata Ganai was out, and Shikata Ganai did his job quite well. The EDR didn't, uh, EDR, antivirus, EDRs weren't a thing back then, didn't really catch that. So life was all good. And you had well-known exploits like Eternal Blue, who were a big thing as well. So life was actually pretty easy for, for a pen tester back then. Or at least I like to think so. As I said, I don't have the battle experience to back that up. But from the stories that I hear, war veterans tell, I, I think it, they, it was an easier job back then. Then, Microsoft kind of caught on a little bit. They introduced MC. And as you can see, we were a kid. Now we're a teenager. Um, MC, pretty good. I'm not going to lie. It's not bad. Um, it helps catch payloads. It helps catch script kiddies. But obviously, we probably all know that MC is not without its flaws. It's just a DLL living in user land. You can manipulate it yourself. If you can actually see the slides, I don't know if it's readable or not, but there are a ton of references to like Brucon in there. I called like Hacksor. I have a string Hacksor that is just i.dll, and then I have a dot uh, a plus ms plus Hacksor. And as you can see, I didn't really took a lot of effort to obfuscate this because normally, if you try to bypass MC nowadays, you see like a crazy obfuscated string. But yeah. The C sharp implementation and just the interoperability between C sharp and PowerShell is rather powerful, which allows you to just do this, which is very low effort. I made this in like five minutes. And yeah, it bypasses MZ. So there you go. Now we are becoming a bit more in like now, in the now. We have EDRs. So that's already a, a big thing. It's not as easy anymore to just drop a payload to disk and expect it to work, you're probably going to get caught. 
And it's not just EDRs that we have to worry about from an offensive point of view. It's also things like attack surface reduction, app locker, exploit guard, patch guard. But the reality of the matter actually is that even though those things exist, if you all saw the Conti playbook that was leaked like two or three months ago, I don't know, who thought that was advanced? There you go. No one raises his hands. Yeah. Very funny, Jeroen. No. So, yeah, but the reality of the matter is Conti makes targets. They don't really care that they hit like 1,000 companies and 99.9% .9 are protected. If they just hit one, it's already a win for them because it's low effort. They don't really have to do a lot. They just write a playbook. They give it to someone. You don't even need to have computer experience. It's literally just type these commands into a command line. There you go. You ransom a company. So even though all these fancy technologies exist, not a lot of companies actually implement these things properly, unfortunately. Even if they have an EDR available, it's usually not as well tuned as you might expect it to be. And it's still, I'm not going to say easy, but it's still possible for a tech savvy person to bypass the defenses. So in order to actually fully understand what we're going to talk about a little bit today, you actually have to know about the Win32 API a little bit. So is there anyone in the audience who is not familiar? I don't want to shame anyone, by the way. This is not like a bad thing. Is there anyone in the audience who's not familiar like at all with the Win32 API? Awesome. So that saves me a lot of work. As you then probably all know, the Win32 API is basically well documented for the most part. On Microsoft documentation online, you can find it every, everything online. It has um, a notorious DLL called ntdll.dll, and that one actually forms the bridge between user land and kernel land. So that does the translation between user mode and kernel mode. Why is this interesting, especially from an offensive point of view? Well, everything that you type that interacts with the Win32 API, for example, kernel32 sleep, because there was a lot of hype about doing like uh, hooking sleep and doing the read execute, uh, read write um, kind of memory fluctuation. If you saw the, the Nighthawk versus Brute Ratel Twitter drama. Um, so, yeah, if you hook or if you call kernel32 sleep, you're actually going to call in the backend an NTDLL function. So, from an EDR perspective, it's very interesting to hook NTDLL. Because everything that you do, every, every, every API interacts at some point with ntdll.dll, which is interesting. And we're going to go into that a little bit more. So as you probably all know, the Win32 API is being leveraged by all applications on your Windows operating system, but also by shellcode. Because shellcode, guess what, is going to interact with the Win32 API, unless, of course, Shout out to the guys from, uh, from yesterday that uh, talked about pick your malware. If you have a fully self-aware um, yeah, shellcode, then it's not going to do that. But guess what? Most frameworks don't do that. Most frameworks rely on Win32 APIs one way or another. So a common use case would be virtual lock, virtual protect, write process memory, create remote threats. Guess what you just did? You injected shellcodes into another process. So trivia time. What happens? If you create a loader that is actually doing kernel32 API calls instead of ntdll while an EDR hooked ntdll.dll, does anyone have any idea? It's an open question. No one? Well, you're going to get detected because you called a higher level function. And that is what you can see here, I hope, in the slide. So there is a pretty nice tool. If you don't know about it yet, you should definitely check it out. It's called API Monitor. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to actually attach to a process and see what that process is actually doing in terms of API calls, hence the name API Monitor. So I just um, attached to a pretty random uh, loader that I created. You can see it there. It's demo basic loader. And as you can see, I call virtual alloc X. That's the blue line. And you can see a distinction being made from virtual alloc X to NT allocate virtual memory. Guess what that means? It means that virtual alloc X in the backend is nothing more than a higher level wrapper for NT allocate virtual memory. 
So if I am now an EDR, and I inspect everything that is going through NT allocate virtual memory, I am going to detect everything that is being called on a higher level. So virtual log X calls NT allocate virtual memory. I'm going to see that. There's also a nice read from Rasta Mouse, if you're interested, about the invoke syscalls. Um, shout out to Rasta. He's actually a friend of mine, and I learned really a lot of things from Rasta Mouse. So you might have seen in the short introduction there when we were talking about the agenda that I like to call EDRs malware. And why do I like to call EDRs malware? Because EDRs behave like malware. They inject their DLL into your process, usually through a kernel driver that is actually listening for new processes being created. If it sees a new process of interest, it's going to inject its DLL. It's going to place hooks on interesting API calls. And then it's just going to wait for you to interact with that. Now, what does that look like? Here, you can actually see, I hope you can actually see that. Um, it's a WinDBG. I basically unassembled NTDLL, NTAllocate virtual memory. You can see on the top that it's actually the example of what NTAllocate virtual memory normally looks like. So that is the assembly code of NTAllocate virtual memory as it should be. And then on the back, like uh, on, on the bottom, you actually see the same exact API call, but now it's hooked. And I hope you can all see that here at the top, you get like a move instruction, you get like another move instruction, but here it immediately starts with a jump to another memory address. And if you would follow that memory address, guess where you'll end up? Into the module of the EDR. Right. So how can we identify as an adversary what API calls are hooked? Well, I actually already told it in the previous slides. We kind of know how NT functions look like. They all have the same functionality. They all have the same assembly codes. I'm going to go back a slide. Everything here, everything here is the same for every NT function, except this little number here, the 18 hex in this case, this is the syscall number. And that syscall number is interesting because that is actually what is being um, called in the backend. So that is actually the function, the NT function it represents, and it changes every operating system version. So in this specific case, 18H might be true for Windows 10, but that doesn't mean that it's true for Windows Server 2016. So you, as an adversary, ideally would have to find a way to dynamically find the syscall number on the operating system you try to target. Because if you don't, and you just send a random payload, and for some benign reason, your customer still runs Windows XP, and you coded your stuff for Windows 10, it's not going to be the same syscall number. So your malware isn't going to do what you expect it to do. So if you now know that EDRs hook certain NT functions, and you know that the first assembly instruction will be a jump to their memory address, you can actually start walking the exported function table from ntdll.tl and just compare everything in bytecodes and see, oh, this function has a jump. That's not normal. And Mr. Unicoder, I don't know if some of you are familiar with him, actually created a GitHub repository. And he crowdsourced the work. He says, look, I created a tool. Run this. If you have an EDR in your environment, run this. Send me the output. And he basically has output for a lot of the EDRs out there. On the right side, you'll actually see uh, the extract of CrowdStrike. So these are all the NT functions and ZW functions, which are kernel functions, um, that are being hooked by CrowdStrike. But as you can see, that list is not that long, right? So how can you, as an adversary, bypass this? Well, there are actually two ways. Well, there are more, but I'm going to talk about two specific ways. Manual mapping is the first one. And how does normal malware behave if it's not being manually mapped? You see here, this is malware. You see here, this is an EDR. My malware is trying to call something from this DLL. Let's say that this is ntdll.dll. I want to call ntallocate virtual memory x. Well, guess what? I'm calling this, but my EDR hooked it. So what's going to happen? My EDR is going to see that I'm trying to do something. It's going to make a decision, ooh, machine learning, and it's going to 
either say, oh yeah, this is fine, I'm going to allow it, or oh, this looks kind of shady, I'm going to throw an alert. By the way, throwing an alert doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get blocked. That's a, another discussion. Um, so yeah, that is how it normally goes. Now, if you manually map, you're actually going to do something completely different. What you're now going to do is you are still malware, but you are now going to say, look, I know that I already have ntdll.tll in my virtual address space because every process has that as it needs to interact with the kernel at some point, but I don't really want to use that one. So can you please load me another one? And that's exactly what you're going to do. You're going to take a new copy from disk of ntdll.tll. You're going to map it in your memory. But now there's a problem because, well, you manually mapped it. So that means that you can just get the function addresses like it normally would because your Windows loader didn't expect you to do this. You manually did this. So you, as an adversary, would have to come up with a way to actually resolve all the function calls in memory by yourself. So you need to take care of all the allocations, all the offsets, all the whole shebang. So that could be quite tedious if you don't really know what you're doing. And unfortunately, most adversaries don't really know what they're doing. So there you go. As you can see here, I'm basically manual mapping. I'm going to call ntallocate virtual memory x, which exists in my memory, ma manually mapped ntdll.dll. My EDR has a hook on the real ntdll.dll, but obviously I'm not calling that one, I'm calling the manually mapped one. Because that one isn't hooked, the EDR won't see it. So if that is a little bit Chinese for you, don't worry, I actually um, dumbed it down a little bit. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're dumb, definitely not. I just wanted to make it more obvious. So here you can actually see what's going on for a syscall. We're now going to talk about syscalls. If I have a function called hooked function, and the function does something like just print I do cool stuff, and I as an adversary know what that function looks like, well, guess what I can do? I can recreate that function. So I basically created a new function called clone of hooked function. It's the same prototype. It also just writes to line, I do cool stuff. So in my main function, if I now call the hook function, it's going to say, I do cool stuff. But if I call the clone of hooked function, it's also going to say, I do cool stuff. So in the end, the functionality is the same, but the API call is different. So EDR or malware, user land, hook bypasses. What can you do? So we already talked about manual mapping. I briefly talked about syscalls, but I'm going to do it a little bit more in depth in just a few moments. But obviously, the first thing you should think about is trying to just don't be malicious. If you're not flagged as malicious, you don't have to do anything fancy. You're just going to get, get allowed. So this is a bit of field testing experience, but you will learn from red team operations um, that some processes are more lenient in EDR's eyes than others. So if you inject in specific processes and you do, for example, an LSOS dump in that process, chances are you're fine. But if you would do the same thing, injecting into another process, chances are you might get caught. So it's a bit of a cat and mouse game and you kind of need to uh, know a bit of the insights or do experiments against the EDR. It's not always possible because EDR vendors, guess what? They don't really like offensive security people to, well, scrutinize them. So if you try to purchase a license for an EDR vendor, guess what they're going to say? <laughs> nope. But it's actually the same thing with Cobalt Strike. So if you're a blue team guy and you try to get a Cobalt Strike license, guess what Cobalt Strike is going to say? Haha, <laughs> nope. So yeah, it's a bit of a cat and mouse game. Everyone kind of tries to um, protect their own intellectual property a little bit. But I'm getting a bit off topic. Off, off topic. So of course, this is the best way to bypass an EDR. Just don't get flagged as malicious in the first place. It's also the hardest one to pull off, in my opinion. You could unhook the hooks. So you saw Mr. Unicoder's GitHub page. You know exactly which functions are hooks. Well, you know how an NT function looks like. If you just look for the syscall number on that system, you could actually unhook the hook. But what if you unhook the hook and you actually call an API that is also hooked? Then you have hookception, and then you're going to start fighting against an EDR. Of course, you could use syscalls to do the unhook, and then it will work. Then manual mapping, what is the downside of manual mapping? 
you manually mapped something in memory, so it leaves in memory artifacts. Kind of makes sense. Syscalls, well, the downside of syscalls is syscall numbers changed based on operating system versions. I already mentioned that. And I see that Olaf is uh, in the crowd as well. So if you follow Olaf for Falcon Fridays, for example, you know that syscalls can get detected as well by integrity checking, for example. So it doesn't necessarily mean that if you're using syscalls, you are suddenly flying uh, under the radar of an EDR because an EDR could check whether or not you're actually calling the syscall from NTDLL or not. And actually, three days ago, I think now, it's October 6th, so four days ago, I don't know, I, I forgot what date we are today. Not that long ago, let's just call it that. I saw an interesting tweet by uh, Vadim, and he actually summarized uh, exactly what I think are the EDR bypasses of today. So you have EDR detection logic bypasses, that's number three over there. That is actually what we're kind of talking about today. So using syscalls, using manually mapping to try and avoid detection because, well, the detection logic isn't there yet. Most EDRs don't really have functionality built in to know if your syscall originated from, in, from like NTDLL or if you're doing it manually. It's just not there yet. Why? I don't know. EDRs just don't think it's that important, I guess. Then you have EDR configuration bypasses. This, of course, depends entirely on your target. Some people have EDRs in very restrictive modes. Others, not so much. And then the final one, I can't really read as, as much, but I think that's the, the technological capability bypass. So that basically means that if you know which functions are hooked and you can achieve the same thing by calling functions that do basically the same thing but are not hooked, you're also going to fly under the radar. So with that being said, I'm now going to give the word to my esteemed colleague, Alessandro, to talk about Inceptor and his research. Thanks, John. I need to switch this on. OK, right. So, <clears throat> so what I always want to bring into attention is that we need to understand that if we want to bypass a target like an EDR, we cannot really forget the basics, right? So uh, we can do a lot of things like using syscalls to bypass the EDR or user land hooking. We can use manual mapping or other cool techniques. But then if we have a payload which contain like known signatures, we're not going anywhere because the AV will stop us. Anyway, so let's think about what we, have, what we want to do every time during an assessment. What we want to do is to switch from an external attacker just come up with some payload delivery mechanism, then bypass the, AV, bypass the AV and we are going to like using evasion techniques to bypass the AV, then we want to bypass some sort of EDR detection, user land hooking and other EDR techniques to like, you, we, want, we, we don't want our payload to leave data that is then collected and send us telemetry to an EDR. And then we want also to bypass OPSEC certain way, in certain way just to like, blend in with the target and just like behave as a as a legitimate as a legitimate executable would do in the system, and after that we are established, right? So this is what we want to do. So we don't forget the basics. Let's start with the AV. So the first thing we want to bypass is the AV. What is an AV? What is what is what kind of uh, what what kind of appliance it is? Well, an AV is quite a complex application, and it's based on four um, four parts. We can say. Uh, NAV needs to have decompressors, which are the ones that, if, we, if I want to analyze anything, I need to analyze it as a, like a byte stream, let's say. So if I want to analyze it completely uh, and I receive a zip file, an archive file, something like that, I need, to some, I need somehow to be able to decompress it in order to actually analyze it for known signatures or for other stuff. Unpackers. Unpackers is another, like, an AV needs to be provided with a lot of unpackers because if a tool has been provided with, say, UPX or a known packer, well, if the AV is not able to unpack it, well, it's not able even to, like, scan it for known signatures or other indicators of, um, like, I'm, okay, I'm actually seeing a malicious binary here. The third Important thing is the scanners. I mean, scanners, we all know scanners because scanners are actually what we use of uh, what we know that we're using in an antivirus appliance. And 
Uh, scanners are mostly divided in two, like there are on-demand scanners, of course, and which are what we see when we have a file on the file system and we just launch a scan against it. And we have in-memory scanners. In-memory scanners is what my colleague was actually presenting, like MSI. MSI is the, like, the, the interface that provides the, 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 like, provide the antivirus, the capability of scanning something when it's loaded into memory. It's, what is hap it, what, it, it's, it's exactly what happens when like, I'm trying to load a binary using assembly load in C-sharp, for example. And then the last bit, which is important as well, is the sandbox. Um, the sandbox is actually an environment that the antivirus creates and it's, you can imagine, like, like a little VM and the binary is just run into the sandbox and if it behaves like a malicious binary, well, it gets flagged. So we need, some, we get, we, we need to come up with a strategy to bypass at least the scanners or the sandbox, of course. If we can provide a binary that behaves quite normally in the, in the amount of time that the antivirus is actually scanning, then we will bypass the sandbox. If we provide a binary without known signatures, we will probably bypass the scanner. And if we provide a binary which can, cannot be unpacked easily, well, we can actually bypass the antivirus always even like that, even using this technique. So always don't forget the basics, we need to understand what we need to bypass when we actually came up with a known payload. So what are we trying to, so here I'm actually dividing our payloads in like native binaries. So here I'm talking about native Windows application, which are like common application that just load NTDLL, DLL, uh, or Windows application, which are like normal Windows application written in C, C++, .NET application, and PowerShell scripts. What we need to bypass. So in the form of a native application, what we need to bypass actually is just the sandboxing, the behavioral analysis. We're talking about loading in memory. So let's say, let's imagine I'm just loading this using a beacon object file, for example. And if instead, if we're loading the, our payload using assembly reflection, so .NET reflection, I need to bypass not only the, sandbo the sandboxing, but I need to bypass also the real-time scanner because somehow, the scanner will actually detect my assembly load and the CLR will actually load AMCDLL in the CLR context. I will let MSI actually looking at what I'm trying to load. It will scan my binary, it will scan my buffer in memory and it will actually detect my payload if anything is malicious and if it contains any known signatures. And PowerShell, same thing actually, real-time scanner is even more annoying because PowerShell actually loads AMCDLL when it's practically when it starts. Um, of course, there is another consideration. If we want to actually stick and we want to plant that file on the file system, then we need to bypass also the static scanner because as soon as my payload touches the disk, uh, the antivirus will try to scan it. So let's start talking about getting rid of our old friends. Like the our old friends is like one of them is of course MSI. And MSI is actually quite easy to bypass. MSI is loaded as a DLL in memory. And if I can get an handle to the process I'm running, so, for, so it's MSI is actually loaded in the context of my own process, or if it's loaded in a process, in a remote process, but I can get an handle to that process, as long as I can get an handle to the process, I can also like patch it in memory. And the patch is usually very convenient because there are three bytes here. Like here, actually, we are storing the length of the buffer that needs to be scanned by Hansi. And what I can do, so EDI is actually gonna, um, is actually here, is actually gonna contain the length of the buffer that I need to scan. So what I can do here is just replace these three bytes with like SOAR EDI, EDI, no. Nope. What, what the effect of this SOAR is that EDI will be zero. So the length of the buffer I have to scan will be zero. And when it reach the point then, okay, I can scan this buffer, well, the length is zero. You don't, have, you don't need to scan anything. And this is the, like one of the no, known bypass of AMSI. So this is one way to bypass AMSI. Okay, we can implement that, easy. What about signatures? Well, signatures are like, have been for a long time the main resource for finding malwares used by antiviruses. Like not, not anymore, of course, and thanks God, not more, but like, like once, once in a time, it was the only way for uh, antiviruses to actually detect viruses. 
And you know what? It's very easy to bypass signatures. It's so easy, actually, to bypass signatures. Because sometimes it's, it's really a matter of what a payload is actually printing at screen. You would be surprised of how signatures are built on like printf messages or console write line messages. It's incredible. It's almost ridiculous, honestly, because you can change those messages so easily. You don't even need to, but to actually come up with a way to uh, like modify the logic of your payload. You just need to basically obfuscate your strings. So, yeah, and this is just a meme saying, yeah, it's not Mimikatz because it's not printing Mimikatz in the banner. What the hell? I mean, yes, it's still Mimikatz. So, the other thing which is, is becoming more annoying to bypass is the sandbox. Um, the sandbox um, will actually run the payload for a certain amount of time in, in, in a sandbox environment, so in a VM. And uh, it's kind of tricky to bypass it. Uh, there are like a few uh, details on, on like publicly available on research to bypass the sandbox. I think most of the work, uh, good work, was done by Emery Knazi and it was collected in a PDF. Um, and you can use a lot of technique, like the, the most like useful are like using behavioral analysis, like usually in, in like, sorry, using the environment. So doing an analysis on the environment to actually come up with strategies to uh, bypass detection using an early return approach. So like if I have this reg registry key, I can return early, I can stop my process from running. Uh, if I have the user in a certain way, if I can access this path, then I'm in a VM or something like that. Um, just because a virtual environment by its nature is not a full environment, so the antivirus will not be able to like give it all the things you would find in a real env environment. And you can use anti debug techniques, like you, you can use like non-virtualized functions. Sometimes some functions are not virtualized to save memory, like virtual alloc X Numa, which is used in multi-processor uh, environments, and FS alloc or other, other, tech, other uh, functions. But also you can provide a file name checking. This was done in macros, like back in the days, like if I have a macro and you know it's the file name is not like the doc file name is not the same, just don't execute this. Uh, environment checking, and you can check for like actually the file system or other uh, or other um, more sophisticated ways. Uh, and you can also check is being the bug, the DR registers that are the one uh, involved with actually if a pro if a debugger is actually listening to my process. And also map session ax section hashing, and this is actually very useful if someone is hooking my own process because if anyone installs a hook in my process and I'm mapping my sections with an hash, if they are if 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 I check the hash of my section and something is changed, well, probably someone installed a hook in my section. Uh, resource disruption, like there is the one million increment or the crazy allocation. This technique is called like the offer you can't refuse, the, the offer you have to refuse. Like if you use a crazy allocation, then the antivirus would say, you know what, in my virtual environment, I don't have one gig for your memory. Like I'm actually trying to allocate for myself one gig in the heap. And it will say, no, 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 no. Just break, the, just break the analysis. Or you can have overly complex decoding algorithms, or algorithms that decodes in only in certain conditions, which is pretty much um, very uh, smart. I had a, a use cases for that. I used, once in a, once in a while, I used um, um, a very, like, not is like a very stupid algorithm that is using uh, for other kind of data sets, which is the run length encoder. A run length encoder is just counts the name or like the number of consecutive bytes you have and just you know transform everything in like number of bytes and the byte number of bytes and the byte and it you know if you have a very differentiated data set it works with zero and one but if you have a very like differentiated data set like it takes a huge time and it comes out that if you run a like a decoding algorithm like that in memory, what it happens is that the uh, sandbox will try to execute it, but it would time out before actually decoding your stub. So it will pass the check. 
Logit exception, uh, you can use impossible branching, like I'm checking a URL and a URL, and if it does exist or if it doesn't exist, I do this thing or I do another thing, or special condition, like, as I said, registry values or other environment variables. These are all techniques that you can use to avoid the sandbox and are pretty much working also nowadays. And another, actually, another uh, thing that you want to get rid of is ETW. ETW can provide a lot of telemetry, tele telemetry that to use actually against your, against an attacker. And what we are, I mean, ETW is a beast. Uh, I'm not going into everything about ETW, but we will just focusing on event registration. So ETW as a way to register event. Uh, usually you use a well-known provider provided by, by Windows with a known guy, uh, sorry, GUID. And you will just, um, like in, during the registration process, when you're registering an event, what you call this ETW event register that will, that will just validate your data and it will call ETW notification register. And this will actually create the structure which is uh, ETW um, uh, reg user data, which is a, like a huge, like huge structure is not correct, it's like to, to 256 bytes, but you, you will create a structure which describes a register, like a registration, uh, user registration for, um, for an ETW event, and it will then insert it into a global like variable, which is the ETWP registration table. So one way to bypass, um, to bypass ETW that doesn't require any kind of patch or whatever, is that we can actually um, exploit, we can actually reach this because as long as we can, you know, as long as we can get an handle to the process we are attacking, we are injecting to, we are using as a baseline for our payload, we can actually navigate and traverse back to this registration table. We can go there and just, oh, sorry, I just mistake. Okay, and we can just open handle by traversing the table, we can open an handle to open to all the registrations items, to all the structure, and we can just call ETW event and register on them. So this is all loaded by Windows, and in that way we will just disable ETW from working in that process. There is another way, which is um, still available inter on internet, which is just patching, of course, ETW is managed by NTDLL, and every event that needs to be like traced, like that need to be put and logged in the trace, in the Windows trace, will eventually be like constructed as a descriptor, an event descriptor, and will be passed to ETW event write. So what we can do is just patch ETW event write in memory um, in like avoiding this ETW event write to actually write in the events log. So this is another way to uh, to disable ETW, but this requires an in-memory patch. So it's actually um, detectable if someone is actually looking at what we're doing in, 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 NTDL, in NTDL LDLL. So now we are, like, now that we get rid of all these friends, we want to actually come back to John Research and say, okay, now how can we bypass more advanced stuff. How can we bypass like EDR and user land hooking, mostly user land hooking? Um, well, we have two ways and we can re-implement the will, like we can re-implement uh, like the ASM code that we need to do for actually loading our shell code using syscalls. This is perfectly fine and actually it's the best approach, but sometimes we're lacking time to do that. So we can also stand on the shoulders of Jant, like uh, a great research by Joru, uh, came up with SysWhisper uh, 1, and we can use the static approach. So the static approach to locate uh, syscalls is um, very is based just on the work of Joru, actually, uh, that you can actually see, because it's on SysWhisper version 1. And it's actually just based on the version and the build of Windows. It will collect like all the syscall numbers for all the Windows version, you can just look up in the table, create your stub for the syscall function with the correct syscall number, and then you, have, you can build from there, you can build a payload using just syscalls that is specific for that target version. But it has limitations, of course, because it's not really what we want. We need to, uh, we need to update these lookup tables every time. It's just not good. That so not as good as 
the second version of Swiss Whispers, which is using a technique which is a bit more like, a bit better, like because it uses a syscall number EAT ordering. So uh, in NTDLL, of course, every syscall has, every exported function has a specific um, ordinal function, ordinal number. And we can, actually, we can actually use an ordering approach in the exported functions to actually locate the syscall number every time. So this is what actually uh, SysWhisper is providing. So SysWhisper will actually provide you with this, with the stub code to actually execute a syscall. And then dynamically, where, you, where you're executing your code, the syscall number will be located and it will be just passed to the stub so you can actually use it. So this is what SysWhisper2 does. And then there is another other two techniques, which is what um, John was talking before, which is manual overload mapping. Manual overload mapping was explained by John before. Um, manual mapping is exactly the same technique. You map a DLL in memory, and you just find the export in that DLL in memory, and you call it uh, when you, um, and usually using a custom version of get module and get proc address. Um, and what you do, like manual mapping misses the fact that um, you, have this set, you have this DLL in memory, but you don't, uh, you're not, like every DLL, which one is in memory, is backed up by a file on disk. So overload mapping is the same technique as manual mapping, that it's just like you open a new section object, you, you open an handle to the anti DLL on disk, you put the handle in the section object with sec image protection, and you're done, it's exactly the copy of NTDLL as loaded by your, uh, by the Windows loader. And, and then there is Elsgate. Elsgate is a function published by Amonsec um, and uh, VX, Smelly VX, which is a technique to dynamically resolve syscalls in memory. This technique was previously used to actually, um, to just dump the content, the ASM content of a DLL, but it can be used also to, um, to actually just call it, just create the stub and call it. And this is what is implemented in Dimbook, which is, which makes this project by the Wover, John and other contributors, um, that makes appealing for us to use Dimbook when we have to use syscalls in C sharp. That's it. Um, Elsgate has only just one problem, um, which uses, um, like, as John was saying, is uses, uh, like, it, it's probably, it's just comparing the stub of the syscall with a known stub. But what happens if the syscall is hooked? The stub will be different from the one I'm expecting. So to solve this problem, Renzo, Sector 7, actually came up with this technique, which is not currently implemented by any tool, actually. So we need to come up with something ourselves. And uh, it's, a, it's a technique which is practically Elsgate plus a patch. So if I find a function which stubs is not matching, I know that it's hooked. So what I do is I navigate to the neighbors till I find someone, some neighbors that is not hooked, and then I traverse back and I patch all the uh, previous function till I have my actual stub and I have my actual syscall number. Very cool technique. Um, I, I actually, um, if you want to dig more with this technique, I like Sector 7, Renzo has a blog post about it and it's very cool actually. So now, then, now that we got how to, you know, how to get there, how to, invoke syscalls and bypass user land hooking. Now, what is the next step? The next step was to bypass like OPSEC or other thing. There are a lot of techniques to bypass OPSEC, but what can we do to make our payload more legitimate? Well, we can do a basic techniques. Uh, these are very basic techniques, but we can blend in a bit more with our target. And what can we do? Well, we can clone metadata, for example. Uh, we can clone metadata to make this payload here to appear a bit more legitimate and cloning all the metadata. I mean, this is very basic technique, but you know, sometimes it works and I'm not kidding. Uh, and we can also use code signing. We can use code signing and we can actually craft a code signing certificate. We can dump one from internet or we can also steal 
a signature from another binary. And this works. I mean, of course, if you check it, if you check the integrity of the file, it will probably don't pass that check because the signature it will be invalid. But the point is that some AV and ADR appliances just care about is this signed or not. It, they won't really go and check if the signature is valid or not. And so it would just say, yeah, I mean, this seems like legit. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's open the gate for, for it. And so the last step. Now that we know a few techniques to do what we want to do, let's bring in automation. Like, yeah, I'm just, because what we ate the most is actually to, I mean, I've seen it multiple times, right? Maybe you've seen it as well in your, like, when we need to craft a payload, maybe we have seven, eight, maybe even 10, 12. We have all these projects with C++, C Sharp projects, and we have also our stub that is mostly like that it works. And we have a Python utility to just take a binary, maybe use Donut to create a shell code or another technique to use to create a shell code. Then we have a Python utility that XOR it, IS encrypted, something like that. Then we copy paste the blob into our working loader and then we compile the loader and we have the stuff we need. Usually I, I've seen a lot of projects like that and I used to have a lot of them. Um, so why don't we actually go and automate all the stuff? I mean, it's, it's possible, is it? So um, here there is the tool to Inceptor and it's Inceptor, what it does, it provides you a set of well-known techniques and it's the first thing of Inceptor, which is very difficult to understand, which is very difficult to explain, is that it's template-based, it's template-driven generation. What it means, template-driven? It means that it's not really limited. It's not a packer which has a specific loader and uses always the same loader. It's nothing like that. You can create your own loader. Yes, of course, it requires you to write your own template because the ones that are publicly available, they will be flagged sooner or later. They still work, though. Um, and it provides you with automatic shell code in creation. You can have your own shell code, you can create one, you can just pass it a DLL, a .NET DLL, a native DLL, a .NET binary, a native, like a native VXC, a .NET XC, doesn't really care. And you can choose if you want to just uh, pack it in a, like, it offered for three languages now. We are providing, sub, we are starting support for more languages, but till now, native language, so C, C++, um, C Sharp and PowerShell are actually supported. Um, it provides you a way for encoding your shellcode using loader dependent and loader independent shellcodes. Loader dependent, it means that the loader knows how to decode the stuff. So it's useful if you are an assembly load function, for example, in your C Sharp, because if you are assembly load, you don't want to have a self decoding um, shellcode in memory because it will not match an assembly signature, so it will not be loaded. Uh, so you want to decode it and then put it and load it as assembly load. It offers for AMC bypasses, ATW bypasses, WRDP bypasses, they are built in, but they are template based, so you can spin in your own AMC bypass, your own ATW bypass, whatever it works for you. It doesn't care because it's a framework. Uh, it offer for like natural obfuscation. It has three ways of obfuscating your payloads. So for uh, PowerShell, is using um, a tool I developed personally, which is which is uh, Chameleon, which is a PowerShell obfusc obfuscator. Um, for C Sharp, it's using Confuser X or like as strong as fuck or like uh, Logic Net, which are three publicly available obfuscator. But it provides support for spinning yours. Doesn't care. Um, and for C, native template is using LLVM. So it's, I mean, LLVM obfuscation is something, is a, an intermediate representation obfuscation that is working quite fine and is actually passing the proof of time because it's actually very difficult to, to detect a payload which is, uh, which is compiled with LLVM. And this is for the obfuscation. It provides you a way of patching, automatically patching. Yes, I, I, I already said, tell, told that one. So it has for ETW, it provides way to just spin up your ETW, WLDP, or MC bypass. And it has also other techniques, other modules you can spin in, like anti-debug, environmental check, whatever you want, actually. Um, 
and we are actually extending it to provide more support for this kind of technique. It automatically compile and pack your binary. Like if you if you are working on like like every module you spin in, what, how it works is that if you're compiling a natin binary, it will just compile every module as a static library. So it will compile it in a lib, and then you can just link it at compile at linking time. So you will have a standalone binary or a standalone DLL that you can use against your car, target. And in, if you actually provide, like if you're actually trying to uh, compile a C-sharp application or a C-sharp DLL, it will just compile every module in a DLL and then it will just merge together using IL, mer IL merge. And then blending it with, that, with, with your target. The blending is done as we've seen before. It will use metadata cloning. It's automatically supported and code signing, both online using tools like carbon copy or uh, offline using SIGTIF or LazySign approach. So this is pretty much it uh, for the slide. If you want to check the, the, uh, the framework is here, it's publicly available, and please check it out actually and send me like bugs, uh, like feature you would like to see, something to, that you would like to be improved, uh, because yes, that would be appreciated. I'm not telling you just take fork and start coding yourself and send me the pull request the pull request is but whatever you can do is really appreciated at this stage even if you can try it against your edr and just send me the result would be just amazing um and that's it i guess yep, I, that's it yeah. are there any questions No, your unit's not on. <laughs> no. The microphone. Everything stops at five. It's five, so <laughs> it's. Yeah, sorry. Everyone has to go home. No questions. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, if you would jump after the EDR, then the EDR will still see what you're doing, right? So that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Yes. Oh, okay. So you want to... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you could do that. That might definitely work, but I don't really see the added value in hooking. Yeah. <laughs> right. If there are uh, no other questions, then I'd like to thank you all for your attention. And we were the last talk, so I don't know if uh, Tom, you want to. Uh, yeah, to say we're going to do a quick outro. So, all right. but please, round of applause for these guys. <laughs>